One of the posts I've got up for this week, the first one is about CSS resets. Um, so this is this is something that I've I've used in examples in the past and have uh, alluded to, but I've, I've never actually talked directly to it. So I thought I just might do that. Um, so the whole reason that CSS resets uh, exist is because if we have a look at any uh, if we have a look at any HTML document like this one that I've got here, for example, which is just a bunch of different uh, HTML elements. And obviously I've got some CSS styles applied to this, but if I remove or if I comment out the link to my style sheet, okay, uh, as, as we've uh, kind of referred to before and, and once you know it it's obvious, uh, but is often overlooked, as you can see without any styles applied there is there is some default style sheet. So the browser is applying its own default style sheet. Um, and every browser uh, will do this, otherwise we would just see uh, everything output with the same style. Um, but there is no sort of standardized preset default that all of the browsers are meant to adhere to. There's nothing saying what the default margins and paddings and sizes for different headings, for example, should be. So while from browser to browser they're fairly similar, and particularly with um, uh, with kind of newer browsers, um, there are subtle differences, and when you go back to older browsers, more extreme differences that will cause the same uh, the same uh, elements to render render, diff render differently between different browsers. Um, and that may, even if that's slight, if that's something like a little bit of extra margin or padding, that can be something that overflows your, your layout and, and causes it to break. Um, so what often happens is you'll, you'll develop your style sheet using one browser and get it to look right in that. And what you usually do is you'll only style the elements that you want to change from the defaults. And what you'll end up finding is that if you go to a different browser, because the default styling for the elements that you haven't overridden uh, are slightly different, then, then it will end up looking slightly different. So the whole reason that we have uh, the CSS resets scripts is to deal with that issue. What they essentially do is take all of the... Uh, they do one of two things. They either give every element a default style, and that's technically what the, specifically the CSS resets are, and then there's this one called normalize, which is kind of the the de facto standard uh, of of CSS resets that everyone uses now. Uh, technically, I guess it's not specifically a reset; it calls itself an alternative to CSS resets. That doesn't really matter. What this does is it keeps any browser defaults where there is no difference across browsers, and it only uh, it only modifies the parts that that do have different implementations across browsers. Um, so it essentially achieves the same effect without having to write as many styles. Um, but all of that doesn't matter so much other than the fact that if you, if you use this it will uh, help in the long run with uh, trying to achieve cross-browser cross compatibility for your, for your style sheets. So all this is is a, a CSS file. If I click this you can see that it's just a bunch of CSS styles, and they style various um, uh, various different uh, HTML elements. So all you really need to do to implement this is very simple: is simply download this file, okay, and save it to your your directory where your where your HTML is. Okay, so here I've got my normalize.css here, and you can include it in in one of two ways. You can either uh, include it in, uh, you can link to the style sheet in the header of your HTML file, um, or you can um, also include it, just include it within your main style sheet, uh, which is what I've done in, in the example code for today. Um, and I actually kind of lean towards this this style of including extra style sheets, um, particularly when it comes to WordPress theming, because as we know, the, for the WordPress theme, uh, it it dictates that our 
Uh, our default star sheet has to be in the root directory and then called star.css. So, so that's always going to be the star sheet that's loaded up. Now we could always use sort of uh, the blog info function and stuff to, to load up other star sheets, but I think an easier way and a neater way of, of keeping it all contained is to just include any other uh, or import any other star sheets that you might need inside of the main star.css file. So that's exactly what I've done here, and all you do is use an at import statement, and then you put the path to the file. Um, and it can be in a subdirectory like some of these other ones are, as you can see, but in this case it's just in the same directory, so it's just the name of the file. And this is very similar to using uh, include statements in, in PHP. All this is doing is it's going and grabbing the CSS from that normalize.css file and it's going to insert it here inside the style.css file. So where, where you place the import statements is, is kind of important. If I were to place it at the end, then that's where it would inject the, those normalized styles. And, and normally what you want to do, or pretty much in every case, is you want to have normalize.css be the very first styles that are applied. Um, because as we know, styles styles that are, are written after another style uh, of the same definition uh, get applied. So what that means is we apply all the normalized styles and then if we want to override anything that's been set in there we have our own style sheet which, which, we can, which can then take precedence. So then the order of precedence would be it would look for our own styles. If we don't bother overriding anything we'd look in normalized at CSS then if it doesn't bother overriding anything it will default back to the, the browser style sheet. Okay, so um, I really do suggest that you use this pretty much in every project. Um, I, I can't think of any good reason, unless you had a severely bandwidth restricted application, um, which is you know practically not going to happen. This is not a big file, um, so I, I'd strongly suggest you use this in 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 your um, WordPress site and also any other um, projects that. Or websites that you might end up working on, um, it would just it would just make the process of, of getting everything to look exactly right across different browsers um, much easier. It'll it'll mean less work for you. And it's very easy to do. Just download the file and then uh, import into your main style sheet. Okay, the next post I've got here is uh, a bunch of different stuff on web typography. So this expands upon the last two lectures that Deb gave. Um, and I guess this is going back a step to more plain CSS stuff, but we kind of want to re we wanted to reiterate a bunch of this stuff because uh, we found that it's it's often overlooked in general in web design and, and sort of in in, in all of our projects as well, um, probably not enough emphasis is placed on um, the typography stylings. A lot of people will choose a choose a font face and then choose different sizes for the font and then they'll kind of stop there. Um, but there's a lot more that you can do um, with your typography and I think it's important to understand why, um, why it's important to, to style typography um, correctly as well. So as I said here, I mean, uh, text is is a huge, is is more than likely going to be a big, a, me, a, a form a big percentage of any of the content that you have, and even if you have a, a mostly visual interface, you're likely to have some sort of um, descriptive text to go along with it. Um, so it's worth it's worth investing the effort in making that text as readable as possible. Um, so I'm not going to go into great detail on a lot of these. Um, but I have I just just know that I've linked a bunch of resources here. I've gone through all of them myself and myself and sort of put the ones that I think will be most useful. Um, but rather than me demonstrating anything, I think these are best digested just by going and reading the articles yourself. But I will point out some things um, where they're relevant, and I will demonstrate a couple of things. So there's this first um, section here about uh, typography conventions. Okay, so there are there are certain conventions that you can point to. You can point to, um, you know, historical use and and research to suggest that certain conventions of, of styling typography uh, are are 
in, in almost all cases ben beneficial to the legibility and the readability of, of that particular text. So a good overview article of, of those kind of rules is this one here, the do's and don'ts of typography. Okay, so it's kind of a fairly simplistic high level overview and it doesn't go into too much detail as to the why, but if you're, if you're willing to take these rules on, on face value, then this is a good place to start. Um, so, and it has visual examples of what they mean by each one. So they talk about things like establishing a typographic hierarchy, and you can see that's illustrated um, very clearly from the difference between these, these two things. Okay, so different bits of text are going to have different weights or different, different semantic meanings, and so by styling them differently, you, you communicate that better to the user. Okay, a lot of this seems obvious and common sense, but a lot of the time it's just stuff that people um, just neglect to deliberately implement um, they, and, and a lot of the time just leave to the, the browser's default choices as to how to, st um, how to uh, style it. Um, selecting, a, selecting a legible font size for body text, okay, again seems obvious but um, a lot of the time people will size their text so that it fits a layout rather than the other way around. So that they might have they might have a huge amount of text that needs to go on a small layout and so to get it to fit they just put a tiny little tiny little font size um, and it fits in the layout but it's not not comfortably readable and then the opposite is true as well. If you don't have a lot of text and you've got this huge layout to uh, to fill up then putting text that's too large doesn't really uh, help the help the cause either. Now a lot of this, a lot of that is usually a symptom of people designing their layouts before they know what their content is, um, knowing how, how much content they have. So I see that I see that a lot, uh, particularly if you've if you've done your mockups and you've not included any example content, you've just kind of included these these ambiguous um, box areas, and say content might go here. Um, then that's that's usually uh, will end up in something like this. You're not not having a good idea, having decided on this fixed layout, and then attempting to get the content to fit to that layout. Um, choosing an appropriate font for the body text. Okay, so so the more the more volume of text that you have, then the more important it is that you have a font that's legible. Again, seems like common sense, but a lot, a lot of time people. To forget or neglect to do that. Um, uh, using too many different fonts. This is kind of a simplistic way of of phrasing this. I think. I think maybe a better way to look at this is having a reason for using different fonts. And I think that links back to creating an information hierarchy as well. But I'll talk more to that in a moment. Um, Giving a text room to breathe, it's just about spacing. Again, all links back to legibility, readability. Um, not making continuous use of all capitals, um, particularly for body text. Um, so particularly on the web, that uh, all capitals t uh, tends to carry a connotation of, of either aggressive, uh, an aggressive tone or, or, or shouting. Um, so you should, you should avoid that unless you're deliberately going for that kind of tone, I suppose. Um, limiting the line length of paragraphs. This is something which is particularly particularly overlooked in, in terms of, of the web. Um, so you'll see this in, in, in print, this is referred to as metering. It's essentially the length of a single line of text and, and there is a certain range of characters. So here they say 40 to 60 characters but you'll see different Different amounts quoted there. It's usually around around this um, around this number of characters, and it's usually less than you think. That is sort of an optimum reading line length, and so there's a reason that novels tend to be the pages tend to be the same width. And you'll find that they generally have the a, a similar a similar amount of uh, words that fit to a line or characters that fit to a line. Um, now the reason that this is kind of a, an extra issue on the web is because we don't, with a book we know it's going to be a fixed width. People can't change the width of a, of a, of a page in a book. But we can, but, 
we can do that in a web browser. Um, so th this is where it becomes a bit more of a challenge because if we've got a, a liquid layout or a flexible layout, then the default behavior is for the, the text to expand uh, to, to, to fit its container. So there are some ways we can get around that and I'll, I'll demonstrate um, that in a moment. But it mainly comes down to sizing things proportionally to the font rather than, um, rather than with, with fixed values. Um, but it also might also might be the case of, of having a responsive layout which which changes the the text to show in columns or in more columns as the layout expands across rather than just one column with a really wide line width. Okay, so there are certain things that you can do. Um, but this is probably it's probably the most overlooked rule, in my opinion. Um, then there's the conventions about um, text alignment. Okay, so um, there are there are there are very there's very good research to to strongly suggest that um, left aligned non justified text for large amounts of body text is the most readable, and so really unless you have a good unless you have a good reason to uh, change that then um, or to go against that rule then that's a convention you should probably stick to, um, and of course. Of course, this all of this is going to be contextually dependent on the type of content you have. So, um, of course, if your content is all haiku poems, then then maybe center text alignment is is going to work like that. But generally, for large, long bodies of text, um, you want left non left non justified alignment. Um, contrast again should be obvious, but is often overlooked. It's the, the in, in, in this case, the um, the the value, uh, what you might call the value, or the, the the brightness and darkness level between the foreground and the background, um, and um, this gets compounded, particularly if you have a textured background. If you have a textured background versus a uh, a flat background, then you'll need even more contrast for it to to retain the same amount of legibility. Okay, so that's that's probably a good sort of like overview of those rules. Um, this next link here uh, is kind of an online reference manual um, for el the elements of type typographic style applied to the web, um, and it's actually it's actually not as long as that looks. Um, I've been through this whole thing, and I think the whole thing is quite useful. Uh, it goes into more detail about a lot of those rules and some other ones, but it also uh, gives you examples of how to implement these various different rules in CSS. So this one, for example, is choosing a comfortable measure, the, the line width. Um, so I would definitely recommend having a read through this resource as well. Um, this article here is this article here rather than uh, rather than um, containing any sort of technical technical information or uh, or, or, or theoretical information this is a, a case study that I just think is quite useful uh, for current typographic design patterns and practices um, by smashing magazine and they compare it to the last one that they did, which was I think in 2009. Um, and it's just interesting to look at some of the, how some of the trends have changed. So one of the most uh, standout or the one of the most striking changes is how the, um, how the, the popularity of, of serif versus sans serif fonts has changed, um, particularly for, for body text. Um, so this particular this particular stat is actually kind of uh, reversed. So whereas sans serif uh, body fonts were more popular now, serif ones are. And you could probably point that towards, or you could look at the you could look at the old thinking, which was that sans serif fonts, uh, sorry, serif fonts, are usually considered more more readable uh, on print. In a print context, and and sans serif fonts more readable on the screen, and the reason for that being that print 
has a, a typically very high resolution, whereas screens had, had a lower resolution. So the, the ability for them to uh, display the fidelity of all the fine serifs uh, was was not they, it just wasn't as capable on lo lower resolution displays, um, but you could probably almost point this this trend towards um, the trend in high resolution displays. Um, so even even before things like um, like retina displays and all that, the 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 average um, the average display resolution of 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 computer displays has been going up anyway over the last few years. So from, from 72 to kind of 96 dots per inch, it's kind of standard now. But it's just interesting to see how the development of the technology changes the trends in the usage of, of things like the type of fonts being used. So you'll see it's a lot more common now than it was a few years ago to have, um, to have uh, serifed fonts uh, on the web. Okay, so they, they go through a lot of different things, um, and that's it's, uh, this might be useful as if, if you're trying to think of some sort of baseline styles to apply that you're not quite sure, then, then having a look at what's popular and what's common might be a good place to start to experiment from. Okay, so I've got a section next called Sizing Text in CSS. Um, so and this mainly center, centers around the, the use of the EM unit. Um, so again, this is something that I have used in examples, but I've never, I haven't really talked specifically to it that much. Um, so uh, I'd say most people are probably still used to sizing their fonts uh, in, in fixed units, like, like pixels, um, because logically I guess it's a bit easier to understand and it, it maps to to a to a, a hard value and people kind of like knowing exact dimensions of things um, but as I'll show you as I demonstrate there are advantages to being able to size things relative to the font size rather than as as, as fixed sizes so for that we use this unit called the EM um, and the EM unit is really just a relative a relative unit um, uh, f for for sizing things based on typography, you can almost think of it as like a percentage. But whereas, if you if you um, size something based on a percentage, uh, then that percentage is a percentage of the width of the containing element. Whereas if you size something based on an EM, then that EM is like a percentage of the current font size. So there's there's an article here on understanding the EM unit, which I think is a good overview. Um, and it's, and it's whether, whether you end up using it or not, I think it's definitely worth wrapping your head around it. Um, there's an article, a list apart article here about how to size text in CSS, which discusses the different methods for sizing text in CSS and the pros and cons of them. Um, and a lot of this, again, has to do with browser cross-browser compatibility. But the general consensus is that um, is that using EMs provides the best flexibility and, and cross-browser compatibility. So this article talks for that and it's probably worth a read um, you know, if you're interested in, in, in why. It probably, probably gives you more, more of an argument as to why using EMs is beneficial. Um, okay, so I will, dem I, I will do a little demonstration now about using EMs to size uh, elements. So I've got uh, I've got this page called typography test here. Okay, and um, first of all, I've got okay. First of all, I've got the um, I've got the root font size set to 16 pixels. Now, if I remove that, nothing's going to change because that's what the default font size of this browser is anyway. But I've got that in there so I can change that later on. So the first thing I want to show you to do with um, uh, to do with using EMs for sizing is, let's say for example, I've um, let's say for example I've got my paragraph um, style here. Okay, and I haven't specified a font size, so it's going to inherit the default font size I've set here, which is 16 pixels. 
Okay, and in this case I've set the line height to 26.6 pixels. Okay, so the line height or the or the letting, okay, being the space between two lines of text. Okay, and this ends up looking like this. Okay, now the problem with setting the line height in pixels if, is if I come back here and decide to end up changing the size of my default font, okay, so I'll change it up, I'll change it up significantly so that the difference is obvious, okay, and I refresh, okay, you can see that the my font size has increased but the spacing between the lines is not. So something like the letting is in almost every instance going to be something that needs to change proportionally with the font size itself. So if I want to come back and, and make this still look the same then I'm going to have to come and change the pixel value here for the line height. Now if instead uh, I had um, if instead uh, I had used EMs for the line height here, so I'll set this back to 16. Okay, and instead of using uh, pixels for the line height, I use 1.6 EMs. Okay, then I get there's my original layout there. But now if I increase the font size without having to change my paragraph style, okay, I retain the same I re retain the same proportional amount of spacing between my lines, whether I size the font up or whether I size it down. Okay, so that's one example of where where specifying the, the dimensions of something proportional to a font is more useful than doing it in absolute pixels. Okay, and so you can do things like uh, styling margins and paddings <coughs> as well, for example, and, and actually that, that will make more sense um, in this next part down here. So the, the main two sections of this page are, are two divs, which have essentially the same content, but I'm going to show you how by styling them using either fixed fixed dimensions or um, proportional dimensions is going to make a difference again in terms of um, maintaining maintaining a good um, visual rhythm within the text when we when we modify the the text size so I've got I've got in my HTML file here there's uh, sorry this one here okay I've got two divs one with the top one with a class of fixed and the bottom one with a class of proportional. Okay, and I've created two different styles for these here. So the fixed div here, I've given a width of 576 pixels and a padding um, uh, set in pixels also. Uh, the proportional div, I've set the width in EMs and I've set the uh, padding also in EMs. Um, now, one of the one of the slightly uh, seemingly tricky at first um, things to do with using EMs is is figuring out what the conversion is between these. So you'll notice that at this font size, my EMs map exactly to that width in pixels. Um, but it's actually quite easy to to figure out what that would be as long as you know how EMs work. So what so basically what you need to know is that one EM is equal to whatever the current font size is. Okay, so these divs, I'm not overriding the, I'm not overriding the font size here. So the default font size for these divs is inheriting from the 16 pixels. Okay, so my default font size is 16 pixels. So if I want a width of 576 in EMs, I essentially just divide it by the font size. So 576 pixels divided by 16. Okay, equals 36. Okay, and that's how I get my 36 EMs. And so I can know how many paddings this is going to be. 1 EM is going to be 16, uh, 16 pixels worth of padding, and 1.5 EMs is going to be uh, 16 plus 8 is 24 pixels of, of padding top and bottom. Okay, so that's why those numbers there, 16 and 24, also match. Okay, so, so at the moment they look 
essentially identical. But where this, where this, we're going to see the benefit of this is, so I've got a, a, a div, just a, a plain div style here, where I've got the font size set to 1EM. Okay, so 100% essentially. Now if I set this to 2EM, okay, it will make these divs the default font size twice what it would otherwise be. So twice 16 pixels would become 32 pixels. Okay, so you can probably guess what's going to happen. In this fixed one, the font's going to get bigger, the width is going to remain the same, and the padding uh, is going to remain the same. In this one here, then the width of the whole div is going to get bigger to accommodate the large text, and the padding is also going to increase with the text as well. Okay, and if I refresh this page, okay, we can see how it looks now. So this top one, okay, we can see that the width has stayed the same, all right, but what's happened is that our, um, our padding in relation to the size of the font is now smaller, um, and, our, and the number of words that fit across that still fixed width is smaller. So what we've done there is we've changed our metering, okay, but with this proportionally with the one that's actually sized based in EMs, what we get is that the exact same number of characters still fit across the width of this div and the width of the div itself has actually changed and the padding has also increased to accommodate the larger text size. Okay, now a lot of people who are really set on a, on a fixed design freak out at this technique because they don't like their divs, they want their divs to be a certain number of pixels wide. But I guess what you've got to, what you've got to kind of weigh up is, is how important it is to you to have exact pixel level control over the dimensions of your layout versus maintaining a layout that's going to keep the content in the most presentable way. So that might be that might might be a way up between how visual your how, how, how visual your content is versus how much text you have. And I'm not necessarily going to tell you to do it one way or the other, but I mean I think hopefully you can agree that in a purely text-based or heavily text-based format that that probably sizing things proportionally to the the text is is going to leave it in a more legible fashion. And we can see the same the same effect um, if I size this down. Let's say I make it uh, 0.5 ems. Okay, so half the the regular font size. Okay, in the top version we end up getting a really long line length or meter, and in the bottom one again, okay, we maintain the exact same. Um, sorry, not me to measure. We maintain the exact same measure. Okay, so set that back to the original. So that hopefully gives you some idea as to uh, as to the usefulness of of setting of measuring things in EMs and um, being proportional to the font size rather than to any fixed dimension. Um, now the other thing it's good for is developing um, what's called a, a modular scale for your, for your font sizes. So you'll notice, you'll notice if, uh, I guess the technique that I like to use is to, to leave my leave my uh, default font size is whatever the browser default is and then use that for the use that for the paragraph and then if I want to size up and down later on I can change it here and then I size everything um, based upon that so I let my paragraph be 1 em and then you can decide how what multiples you want of, of that font size to apply to each of your headings so for example here my heading 3 is 1.5 times as big as a paragraph the heading 2 is 2.4 times as big and the heading one is 3.2 times as big. Okay, so again, rather than fixing it, rather than thinking in specific pixel sizes, you, if, by thinking in, in in sort of multiples, then I think that maps better to thinking uh, to thinking in terms of the importance or the the visual hierarchy of 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 the particular uh, bits of text. Because um, when you when you're talking about font sizes. It really does go back to developing that information hierarchy, and and what you want to, and what's more important than thinking about, I think, than thinking about physical dimensions is 
relative, relative importances of the different bits of text. So how much more prominent do you want the heading 1 to be than the paragraph and how much more prominent do you want the heading 2 to be and the heading 3 to be? I mean that's really when it comes down to what, what, what those different bits of text are meant to be saying. Okay, so so this kind of goes on to my next point about uh, just generally styling text in CSS, and this this all points to what I mentioned before is is there's a lot more to styling text than simply just picking a font face and a few different font sizes. Um, so so a couple of a couple of these articles talk about talk about you know some of the more common different things you can do. Um, to, to differentiate the styling of your text. Okay, so you've, you can do things letter spacing and word spacing, um, text alignment, indentation, line height, okay, all of this sort of stuff. Just to reiterate that point again, um, there's a Smashing Magazine article here which actually suggests a process for thinking about all of these different things and, and what steps to think about them in. And this article actually adv advocates using um, um, aligning or or, or uh, attempting to align your your typography to a grid to create a consistent um, horizontal and, and vertical rhythm, and it talks about how it can do that. So this, so this, uh, these two images here kind of represent that example. They divide they divide the page logically logically up logically up into as well as vertical uh, divisions of the grid, horizontal ones, and then aligning aligning the, the text to that. So that's one approach you could take as well. Um, and it talks about setting a scale, so uh, what I just said about, you know, sizing things based on their importance rather than based on any specific physical dimensions. Okay, but all this comes back to essentially this point here, this cre creating an information hierarchy with typography. So the, the example site that I've linked from here is the New York Times website, okay, which is a very, very text-heavy site. Okay, so you can see um, ba basically, basically what I want you to take from this is, is they haven't just chosen arbitrarily to apply different text styles to different things. Okay, they each have a different meaning. And you've you've got basically two things that you want to do when you're styling your text differently. You want to uh, you want to one create a vertical vertical differentiation within the information hierarchy, and that means making the things that should be the most important or eye catching look that way, and then less so as you go down to the to the less important things. And then there's hor what I'd call horizontal consistency. So Let's just take let's just take for example uh, these these two little news article excerpts here. Okay, so if I look at um, if I look at one, okay, that's sort of the the boundaries of what one looks like. And within this, we can see there's um, a few different levels of information hierarchy. If I was going to point to to, I mean, the, obviously the most important part is going to be this one. Okay, the the sort of the heading. Um, probably the next important is is the body text, and then the and and you could argue then maybe this one, and then probably the least important here is is probably uh, the the author tag here, and you can tell that because of the visual what I'll call the visual contrast, but I don't just mean contrast in a brightness darkness sense. I mean any sort of visual difference between the styling. Okay, so they use things like different font faces, colors. Um, sizes, um, um, different spacing, um, okay, all sorts of all sorts of different all sorts of different combinations of any of these different ways you can style text will allow you to create contrast between different um, semantic or different bits of text that have different semantic meanings. So that's the ver that's the vertical information hierarchy. But then if we compare these two. Okay, I could go and create. They could have gone and created a completely different information hierarchy. Use different styles, which still had an internal hierarchy, but were completely different. So the other part is about creating consistency. 
So because these two bits of content are essentially, they mean the same thing, then they use the same consistent um, hierarchy across those two, two um, bits of content. Okay, and this is really where your style sheet comes in, identifying those consistent um, vertical hierarchies of information and then consistent horizontal uses across different parts of the page so that things that should have the same uh, connotation uh, are styled the same. Okay, and you can see this in, in, in lots of others. If we look at any of the any of the Smashing Magazine pages, if we look at their article excerpts, okay, again, you could just take this article excerpt and you could probably pick maybe almost 10 different distinct visual styles that each carry different meanings for the different bits of text within here. Okay, so that's what we really want you to think about is, is, is why you're styling the text differently. And that's why I kind of, I kind of said that, that that rule about not using too many different fonts um, was a bit simplistic. It's not so much don't use too many fonts, but when you do style text differently, the user is going to expect that that has a meaning. And if it doesn't, if, it, if there is no inherent meaning as to why you've styled something differently, then that's going to confuse the user. Um, but equally, if you have, if equally if you have um, different bits of text which should have different inherent meanings, then uh, it's going to confuse the user if you don't style them differently. Okay, um, there's another article here, achieving good legibility, uh, which covers again a lot of these different, um, a lot of these different uh, ways of styling text. And how how combinations of them, um, you know, can and can go towards um, improving the readability. Oops, didn't mean to do that. Um, okay, now this next section here uh, again, this is something else which I have been using in the examples, and I'm sure a lot of people have already used custom web fonts already. Um, but I've never spoken specifically to it, so I thought I, I would just do that quickly um, if, if there are, are people who want to use it but aren't quite sure how to do it. Um, so basically we're at a point now where um, it used to be that, that uh, your choices for fonts on the web were essentially limited to what were called web-safe fonts. Um, so there was, a, there was a handful of fonts which you could be pretty sure in, installed on everyone's uh, everyone's device or, or computer who was going to uh, access your web page in the browser because there were default fonts that were installed on every operating system essentially. Um, and then, but obviously, obviously, designers don't like to be limited to their choice of fonts, so you had a whole bunch of different options. Usually at, in the beginning, if your only option if you wanted to use a custom font face was to embed that text as, as an image. And that's got problems because you can't edit that text, uh, it can't be searched, it can't be indexed by a search engine. Um, and, and ideally you would want to be able to embed custom fonts uh, as, as text. And so we do have that ability now with CSS3 um, using that uh, at font face declaration. Um, and so, um, so it's, 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 not, it's not something that's technically complicated, but the, comp the, the complication tends to come due to, uh, again, um, because this is a developing standard, differences between the way that different browsers like to implement uh, the, the same feature. Um, so there's a, an article here which is a good overview of, of custom web fonts. Uh, that's definitely worth a read. Um, and then there's a more, there's another article here which goes more in depth into custom fonts in general and talks a bit about other various options that sort of bridge the gap between uh, just using built-in fonts and, and, and custom web fonts today. So there used to be all these other, all these other options that people used to use like using Flash or using fancy JavaScript things to swap characters in and out for uh, images individually on a letter by letter base but fortunately we don't really have to worry about any of those anymore um, 
because we have um, support for the font face declaration. Um, okay, but to probably to bring out the most important points of, of these articles is it boils down to there's going to be essentially two ways that you will get a custom web font into uh, your web your web page. Um, and uh, the first way is to include it from a website that hosts that font remotely and you link to that remote font just like you may have in the past linked to remote versions of jQuery for example. So there's a bunch of these services and uh, a lot of them are listed in this six revisions article here. Um, some of them are free, some of them you have to pay for, okay, but they all essentially operate the same way. They, they store the fonts on their server and you link to their server. Um, the Google web fonts uh, is a good one because it's free um, and it's probably the easiest way to, to include custom fonts in your, um, in your website. So I'll just demonstrate that quickly now. There's a link here to the Google, Google web fonts site has a nice interface which allows you to uh, which allows you to browse different fonts so you can for example let's say I'm looking for a, a serif font for my uh, body body text and I can look at it in various different ways and look at, at paragraphs of it okay so I can look through and see what it looks like and find one that I like the look of and then select it so I I think I chose one. I ended up selecting one called Merryweather here. So let's say I decide on this one. I choose this for my, my body font. Then I can just come down here and click this little button here. Okay, and it brings me to a page that looks like this. And um, basically I have to select a few different options. Now what you might what you might not know about um, about fonts is that um, for each different style of the font, so uh, for, a, for a regular version of the font, a bold version of the font, an italic version, a bold italic version, and all other combinations of those, it actually, uh, a, a font that does it properly actually has to store all of those characters um, multiple different times for each of those different styles. So if you want to use those different styles within your HTML for a custom font, what you need to do is include each of those styles. If I don't do that and then I go and style something, let's say I just include the normal and then I go and um, style it as bold or italic, what the web browser will do is, is apply what's called a, a faux bold or a faux italic style to uh, that font and uh, it will work but it just doesn't look as nice as, um, as, as the actual the actual font, font style that, that is, is designed for those things. So Creating a bold font um, usually involves more than just adding, say, a, a, an extra bit of dark stroke around the outside. There are, there are slight differences. But anyway, the take-home point from that is if I'm using this, let's say I want to use this for my paragraph text, then in my mind there's a possibility that, that in somewhere in my paragraphs I'm going to want to bold something or italicize something. So I, I have to decide... I, I'm going to want the normal, um, I'm probably going, but then I'm also going to want to have the italic version of normal, the bold version normal, and if I want to bold italic anything, that as well. Now, in my, in, in, in my design, let's just say I've decided there's going to be no reason in my body text for me to use the light version or the ultra bold version, then I'll just select these ones. The reason why you wouldn't select them all all of the time is because these are custom fonts that don't exist on the user's machine, these have to be downloaded as a resource and loaded. So you'll notice over here as I click more of these, uh, this indicator which shows me the page load time goes up. Okay, so for each one of these that I include, uh, there's more, more bits of data that have to be transferred to the browser. Um, so the best thing to do is only select the ones that you're going to need. So I'll select those four, um, and then down here, uh, it tells me a couple of different ways that I can include the fonts. So I can link it, um, I can link, basically this, basically what will, basically what you'll be doing is linking to a CSS file, you can see here in the CSS, a CSS file on Google's um, 
on Google's servers that are going to um, declare all of these font font faces and then point to the font files themselves. So there's a couple of ways you can do that, just like we would with um, a CSS file uh, that we would include locally. We can link to it, okay, using a link, uh, using a link, but with a remote URL for the href. Or as I showed you before, we can also use the import statement. And again, I'm kind of leaning towards doing it this way because it just keeps, I think it, it keeps um, everything together in terms of everything that styles better. So that's the method I'm going to use, but really you can choose which either you can choose either method. Um, I'm not actually sure the reason why um, you would need a JavaScript method. I'm not sure. I'm sure if you look in the documentation, it will tell you. Um, but I can't really think of why you would need that over these two op first two options. So there's two parts to getting this to work. First, we have to point. Uh, point to this remote CSS file which contains the font face declarations and then wherever we want to use the style in our uh, CSS then it tells us here the font family that we should use for that. So I'll do the first part first. I'm going to use the at import um, directive and include that in my style.css and you can see I've already done that here at import URL Fonts.google API. Okay, and you can see um, you can see it actually. Uh, we're telling it which which fonts we want, which styles of the font we want using these get parameters. Um, but you don't need to worry too much about that because we just copy and paste the the code that Google font that the Google fonts uh, page gives us. So once I've put that in there, once I've put that at import statement. Um, then I'm able to access in any of my other styles that particular font. And as I said, I do that by, um, by referring to the font name that it tells me to here, in this case, Merriweather. Now what this is doing is suggesting that we use a font family um, which defaults back to serif here. Okay, and it does that. So I've got this, I've got this applied to my paragraph style here. Okay, so when I look at uh, let's see. So when I look at my test page again here, okay, this this already has that font uh, applied to it. Now, now it is possible that there'll be a browser that can't load custom fonts. It might be an old browser, or maybe um, this URL is down. For example, there may be some reason why the custom font cannot load. Um, so in that case, it's always recommended that you have a default web safe font um, fallback specified in the font family so that if this one doesn't load it falls back to this and I can test this by um, by commenting out this line where I import where I import that that font from the Google web fonts and if I refresh this you'll notice it won't be a big difference because they're similar fonts but okay you'll notice that there is different there so that's loading the fallback Okay, and obviously it makes sense to use a fallback which looks as similar as possible to the uh, the original font or the custom font that you you've specified there as well. Okay. Um, okay, and I've done a similar thing uh, with. Okay, I've, done, I, I've, I've included a couple of other Google Web fonts here. I don't think I've used that first one, but this one here I've used for the heading heading one, Droid Serif. Okay, so you can see that there. And again, if that... Okay, if that, if that fails to load, then it falls back to my uh, Serif font as specified in the font family here. Okay, so, the, so that's, that's the process of adding a Google web font, um, and that's the, the easiest way to do it. And if you can find a font that, that you want to use on Google web fonts, then I'd suggest that, that that's probably the, the fastest, easiest way to get that working. Um, okay, now the other option uh, is uh, to install the fonts on your web server yourself, and then create your own font face declarations. Now, if you're going to go down that route, then I recommend using this website, Font Squirrel. 
Okay, so Font Squirrel has a whole bunch of fonts, and I I've selected one. Look through, select one called Roboto. Okay, and if I click on if I click on this here, I can see what the font looks like. Now, sorry, I'll just take I'll take one small backward step, and it might be useful to look at the font face declaration and what it looks like. Okay, so this is basically what the CSS file that we included uh, from Google servers would have looked like if we could see that CSS file. It would have a bunch of these font face declarations, or it would have a font face declaration for each of the font styles that we um, that we included. So this is the syntax that we use in, in our CSS document if we want to create a font face using our own font files that we put on our server. So it looks like this, at font face, and then the curly brackets, and then the font family here, so that's the name that we use when we want to apply that font to a style, and then this source parameter here is where we pass it, um, where we where we give it the the uh, link to the um, font files, the various font files um, that describe that font, which we would put on our server. So now the now the the, the as I said, the co the complexity comes because every different browser or each of the different major browsers uh, has a different file format for the for the font file which they like to have. And so, and so the, the, the hardest thing is getting all of those different font files. So the good thing about Font Squirrel is that um, for any of the fonts on here, I can, um, so I, I could download, I could download the single um, TTF, true type font file, which would be the kind of font file that you would download and load up in, in say Photoshop or something. But I can also download there's a link here to a web font kit, and if I download this, you'll see what it looks like. So I'll select some options, click download, and it will download me a zip archive here. Okay, so if I open this up, okay, I can see a whole lot of different folders. So again, each of these, so this font actually contains a lot of different, subtly different styles for this font. Okay, and each one of those styles is going to have to have its own set of font files. So these are each contained within uh, within their own folder. So if you were to, if you if you were to have to generate all of this stuff yourself, this would take quite a lot of time. You have to find some way of generating all these font files and one and a bunch each for each different style. So fortunately, Font Squirrel handles all this for us. So the important files here are these four here. Okay, so the EOT file, SVG file, TTF file, and WOFF file, and these are the these are essentially they're the same font file, but they're in different formats that the different browsers like or want to use. Um, and so, as part of the font face declaration, we have to point to each one of these different files. And there's various subtle things to do with the syntax to work around getting getting all the browsers to to recognize them properly and not pick the wrong one and so forth. But again, fortunately with Font Squirrel, it includes this um, starsheet.css file, which contains all of that for us. So what I've done is in, in my project here, I've included three variations of this font that I want to use, the, the bold, light, and regular versions. And as you can see, if I look inside this regular version and look at the style starsheet.css, okay, they've written the the font face rules for us, and all of these WebKit font packs will contain this. So that saves us a bunch of time um, having having to do that. Now I could copy this font face declaration into my style.css file, um, but that would actually break these links. I'd have to rewrite these links with a new path. So again, the easiest thing to do, uh, I think, is to just include the folders or the fonts that you want to use and then go to your style.css file, and again using the at import directive. Okay, I will I will just include the link to the starsheet.css file that is inside each of these font folders here. Okay, so there's the one for the regular, the light, and the bold version of those fonts. So once I've done that, I have 
the three different font face declarations which point to all of the variations of those font files. So all of the browsers are taken care of. Now all I have to do is, uh, is use the, the name of the font um, in, when I'm applying it to a, a style on my CSS. And again, to find that out, I just look inside of the style sheet and I refer to, well, let's see, um, let's have a look at the regular one. Style sheet here for Roboto regular, okay, and so this is what I was referring to before, the font family here. So when I want to apply this font to a particular style, to a font family, that's the name that I use in my CSS. Okay, so that's for the regular one. If it was the bold one, okay, it would be this one here, Roboto Bold. Okay, so that's exactly what I've done here for um, the heading 2, for example. I've applied the font family of Roboto Regular, and then my default fallback is um, the sans serif. So Roboto Regular itself is a sans serif font, so it makes sense to have the fallback as, as a sans serif font as well. Okay, and so that is... Okay, that is what it looks like. So... That's my heading 2 with the custom font applied. And again, if I, let's see, if I get rid of these imports, all right, then because I've set a, a sans serif as the default fallback, then it will be different, but hopefully subtly different. You can barely notice a difference there, really. Okay. So, okay, so that's custom fonts. Um, Okay, so just as the, the final part to the custom fonts there, I've, I've provided a couple of links to some information about some of those potential issues you might come across using custom fonts. That mainly relates to what I talked about before. If you don't have the exact styles for, say, bold or italics, and you would try to apply bold or italics, then um, you'll get the, the faux styling, which won't look as good. But that's more about choosing the correct font for the job than anything else. Okay, and the last part of this post I've got here is just a link to typography frameworks. Um, so uh, now there's a bunch of these. I've just linked to one of them. It's fairly new, called Typeplate. Um, and what this is is uh, it's essentially another CSS file which contains, based on you know some philosophy that the people who created this have, uh, some default styles for uh, for various different textual components, um, so you can look at you can look at what this looks like, okay? And you can see uh, you can see how they kind of style things. Uh, if you go to the the main page, okay, you've got links to download as downloaded as CSS. <laughs> but whether or not you use it, I think this is still kind of useful for having a look at some of the philosophical reasoning they have behind the way they've chosen their default styles. Um, and so that's explained on this page. Um, so using this again is just going to be a matter of downloading that uh, and including it again here just using an import statement uh, to, to import that, that CSS file. Um, and so again making sure that things are implemented in the right order you would normally include normalize.css first and then template Dot C, type plate dot CSS on top of that and then if I remove all of my uh, default styles here then okay I can see uh, I can see what their default styling looks like okay so they've obviously chosen some sort of they've chosen default sizing for headings. Um, they've decided to do things like indenting um, um, s subsequent paragraphs in multiple paragraph levels. Um, so as I said, whether you use that or not, I don't have any recommendation one way or the other, or the other but it's there and if, if it suits what you want to do, then, then that's how you actually implement it. Um, I should just go back a little bit because I forgot to mention one thing when I was talking about uh, EMs up here. Um, so let me just backtrack a little bit.
Okay, so... Okay, now, uh, so I was talking earlier about uh, the EM unit, and I did, I did neglect to mention one fairly important thing about that. Um, and that is that the EM unit uh, is compounded when you nest elements. So the easiest way to demonstrate that is, uh, you'll see here I've got uh, a list item, which is nested three levels deep. So there's a list item with another list inside it, which has a list item with another list inside that, which has another list item. So there's three, three levels of list items deep. Now what, what you notice is, if I do something like this, I set a style on my list item, and let's say I make the list item uh, font size 1.5 EMs, okay, then that will make it 1.5 times the current uh, font size there. But what you will see is that it doesn't style each of these equally. What it does is it's, it's compounding it. So at the top level here, the, the font size will be 1.5, but then the next level down, uh, the, the font size is already 1.5 there. So it's going to compound that again with another 1.5. So you're essentially getting an extra factor of, of sizing each time there. So 1.5 and then 1.5 times 1.5 and then 1.5 to the power of 3. Okay, so that's usually not the behavior that you want. There's two ways around this. First of all, you could set, um, you could set a style for any list items that are underneath a list item to have set their font size to just be 1 EM. Okay, so it never compounds any further. The other thing you can do is use a newer unit of measurement that's very similar to the EM. It's the same as the EM in every way except that it doesn't compound. And it's called the, the root EM. And, and the unit is written as REM. Okay, and what that does is it will always be relative to whatever the root font size is. Okay, so if I set the list item and have 1.5 root EMs, then each compounded list item is always going to be 1.5 times that 16 pixels. Okay, so I get the same effect there where they're all consistent. Okay, so that is, that's everything to do with typography. Um, there's, as I said, I, I, there's, there's a lot of, there's quite a lot of detail in some of these posts and I do recommend that at some point you go through and, and read them. The higher, the, the higher up ones, probably the more, more overview and then as you go further down, there's more, more detail. Um, um, but but I, I think it's it's definitely definitely something that that's worthwhile looking into, uh, and then finally um, I've added a post uh, about just general CSS three stuff. Again, this is stuff which you may already be familiar with, and I have been using in the examples, but I haven't as yet talked specifically to it. So uh, I thought it might be useful to provide this. I already have a screencast of the tutorial I did last year, but rather than then going through it as a specific tutorial because it may not be super relevant to everyone, I've just provided this as a separate post here. Um, so there's a screencast here from last year, um, and then I've just got links to more details about the topics that I go through there. So I look at things like drop shadows, gradients, masks, reflections, transformations, transitions, and I go a little bit into our custom fonts there as well. Um, but I would probably make information in this post probably much more up to date than that so if I say anything conflicting in that old screencast uh, then take anything I've said to do with this um, over that also I probably refer in this screencast to different assessment it's just because it's from last year just ignore that if it doesn't make sense um, and then I've got a link to the, the demonstration exercise files there so that's there um, quite a lot of content to go through if, if you need it um, um, but it's, it's certainly stuff that if, if, there's, if there's room in your design for implementing these things then there's probably the way, the way to go rather than using any older hack methods of achieving the same effects.